Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode 102. In this episode, I interview Tim McCormick. He has been gardening for 12 years and is the owner of Cultured Biologics, a company that formulates and manufactures an organic product line. Tim has an extensive background in horticulture, everything from chemistry, microbiology, plant physiology, soil science, entomology, and plant pathology. This is actually Tim's second time on the podcast. He was on episode 41, where he talked all about bro science versus grow science. In this episode, he talks all about increasing the flavor that plants produce. There are various things that you can do to plants when growing them to increase their flavor profile. Tim gets into all of that. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring free gardening information of all plants to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. They now have humidifiers called the Cloud Forge. I've been using the Cloud Forge T3, which has a 4.5 liter capacity and can be filled from the top. It also includes a hose, so you can place the humidifier outside your grow tent and feed the hose into your grow tent, saving you precious space. It also connects to the Controller 69 Pro, so you can control it from your smartphone. I'll have a link in the description section below so you can learn more about their humidifiers and the discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Tim McCormick. How are you doing today? Good, good. How are you? Doing good, man. Thanks for asking. This is your second time around. Uh, so we did an episode all the way back in episode 41, Bro Science versus Grow Science. And I was just looking today at the number of views, over 85,000 views on that episode. <laughs> it was definitely one of the top episodes. And uh, I remember there was a lot of stuff in that video that you just, a lot of bro science <laughs> that you had to dismiss there. It was, it was pretty funny. It was a good one. Yeah, that no, was, was a great episode. I, I still get, I just talked to a guy named Joe today. He was like, hey, I was watching your video on Mr. Grow It. And I just had to, I had to message you and just talk to you about the stuff you guys, you guys talked about. It was great. So I still get traction from it today. So it was, it was a great episode, man. Thank you. Yeah, so much good, valuable information in there. And I'm glad you decided to come back for uh, another time around here. And uh, we got a real hot topic for you again here, flavor, how to bring off flavor within plants. So uh, I feel like, you know, 10 plus years ago, it was all about yield, right? People are looking to do things differently to the plant in order to increase the yield, but there wasn't as much focus on flavor as there is today. I mean, it's, you know, the more people we talk to, how do I increase the flavor in my plant source? How do I increase the smell in my plants? And uh, less talk about yield. In this episode, we're going to get into a lot of different things within the grow that impact flavor. So I'm really excited for this one. But first, can you introduce yourself for those that didn't catch the first episode we did together? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Tim McCormick. I am the president and formulator of Culture Biologics. Uh, we're a uh, unique fertilizer and biopesticide company. Uh, we really started off in do, do, doing microbes and putting our growth technology into the micro formulations. And recently we've just launched our new nutrient technology. Um, so we're, we're all about innovation. We're all about customers first, growers first. You know, I'm a grower that made fertilizers for other growers. Um, so it's all about, it's all about the culture for us. It's all about um, everybody looking out for each other and just trying to grow the best, uh, the best plants possible. Awesome. So getting into flavor, I feel like we need to kind of start with the basics, although it's going to get advanced pretty quickly here. Um, so talk to us, what is the source of the flavor that we get when consuming these plants? Sure. Yeah. No, it, um, the oil inside these trichomes, these glands, um, is, is, is a lot what you're, what's reacting with your taste buds and your palate. Um, but you know, there's, there's so many things that go into producing actual flavor, what your mouth or your palate is reacting with. Um, a lot of this phenolic compounds, you know, when we, the, the, the flavor of, of, of the cannabinoids, um, to terpenes, you have mono, dye, tri, sesquiterpenes, um, those all turn into, those are all grains from small flavor molecules to large flavor molecules. Um, and then those even will turn into flavonoids and we have esters and thiol compounds like the skunk smell. So there's a, a, a multitude of compounds that are within the plant. 
um, contained within the oil and even the plant tissue itself that that all lead up to to um, to what the flavor is. You know, the sap content is is a lot of where all these compounds will reside, like the fluid inside the plant. Um, so when you burn the 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 the, the flower, or when you're you're tasting all these uh, molecules inside the fruit or vegetables or what have you, um, it, it's, it's, it's a range of compounds that the plant's biochemically producing. Um, the plant from the time that it grows from a seed to the time that you pick the fruit or harvest the plant, um, it's a biochemical machine that is constantly taking metals and ions and other, other simple molecules and turning them into these complex things that we, that we call the, the taste and the, the smells and, and the effect. And there are various things that are said that impact the terpene profile, right? So uh, we'll go through a list of things here. But let's start with lighting. Can lighting impact the terpenes that are produced? Oh, absolutely. Um, let's, you know, you got to think about what a terpene is. You know, it's, it's the aromatics of the, of the, the plant. Um, why do plants produce these? You know, plants produce them to ward away um, other animals, other creatures that might want to infest the plant. Um, eat the plant, um, consume it. It can act as a, uh, an attractant to other other insects and other other animals and other bugs to come eat it, so it can digest the seed and, and deposit the seed. But the terpene itself is um, is a phenolic compound that the plant produces um, inside the the oil gland, and these oil glands are 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 what we call secondary metabolites of the plant. Uh, the plant produces um, resin and, and trichomes as a self-defense mechanism. Any bugs that are trying to walk through the plant to eat the plant, they'll get trapped up in the resin, stuck, and they can't move, they can't really feed, they can't do anything. So um, the environment, specifically the lighting, um, is impacts the, 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 the formation of the resin gland and what's inside the resin gland. Because if you get down to like the resin gland itself, it's a sphere. And it's a perfectly designed sphere, so it can take in the UV radiation from the sun and and diffract it and break it apart, so the UV radiation doesn't touch the the plant tissue because UV radiation is is harmful to every every living organism. And so plants produce um, secondary metabolites like resin, like trichome resin glands, to help protect itself from UV radiation. UV radiation. So long story short, the lighting can absolutely impact the terpenes being produced. The the, the active compounds inside these, these resin glands, the, the flavonoids, any, any type of compound inside these resin glands can be directly impacted from the lighting itself, which is why you see certain UV contents to indoor lighting because you need the UV radiation to signal to the plant that I need to produce trichomes so I can form um, a barrier between me and the UV radiation. And with that comes with, with the terpenes themselves too. So besides UV, can any of the other spectrums of light impact the specific terpenes? Like, do we have any control over that? Like limonene, myrcene, so on and so forth. Is there spectrums of light that trigger those specific types of terpenes? Yeah. Um, that's why you see a lot of difference between uh, LED lights and like CMH to HPS and the different resin output. Um, you have people put, um, you know, the far reds in their LED diodes to help trigger the plant into producing more, 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 um, more chemicals inside the oil gland, trigger specific biochemical responses to the plant. The, the, the spectrum is like the plants growing outside get a completely different spectrum of light from, from the colors to the UV radiation to everything in between that really affects the, the compounds that the, that the plant's biochemically making. Um, I, I personally believe that the photons and all the different spectrums outside it caused the plant to biochemically create different terpenes than you would inside different uh, uh, active compounds outside compared to inside. Um, I would say the color goes into it. The, 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 the uh, UV radiation goes into it. The infrared goes into it. Um, everything, everything regarding the light really goes into the production of, of all these, all these active compounds that the plants are making. That's super interesting. Now, what about some of the environment conditions? Now, of course, outdoors, temperature, humidity, CO2, you don't have any control over that. But for the indoor growers, they're doing things. They're, they're changing the temperature. They're changing the humidity, the CO2 levels. They're adjusting all that in order to try to get a better flavor. Can any of those environmental conditions impact the terpenes that are produced? Absolutely. Um, 
you know, your, your CO2 level that the plant takes in is part of its, 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 uh, the ability to photosynthesize, right? Um, ability to take compounds and convert them from photons, convert them into sugars and pass those sugars along. Um, your, your airflow is, is extremely important. Your humidity levels, the amount of moisture that the, the plant can transpire at one time will dictate the amount of nutrients being taken up, which will dictate the chemo profile or the chemotype of the plant, which is just, you know, the different mixtures of compounds that the plant takes up over time inside your, your environment is, is going to dictate what the end result is going to. So everything down to your CO2, to your air exchange, to the type of photon, the lights are going to put out are eventually going to create a different biochemical effect and result inside the plant. Um, probably more so indoors because you have to act like God and you have to fine tune all the little different details of everything. Whereas nature itself is just, has been evolving millions and millions of years to, to perfectly condition, provide the perfect condition for plants to grow and to mature and, you know, different latitudes and longitudes and, um, and, and just generally how the plant's going to develop and, and evolve, you know, indoors, it's so much more fine tuned and you can really see the deep, the, how, how much of an impact just even your CO2 levels will have your, your PAR, um, uh, readings will have your, um, how much water the plant takes up throughout the life cycle. Cause that's hydrogen and oxygen content that the plant's going to turn into other molecules that have hydrogens and oxygens into it. Okay, so for temperature and humidity and CO2, is there a specific temperature that you tell people to aim for and humidity that you tell them to aim for and then CO2 level that you tell people to aim for in order to get the most terpenes? Yeah, a lot of it comes down to environmental conditions that are favorable for, for the plant just to do what it naturally does. You know, we are, we are aiding in the process of these plants growing. You know, we can't really control much. Um, you, you're kind of putting a, a, you can control your environment and then you put a plant there and it's going to react to whatever the, the variables that the environment gets to. And that's where your, your pheno, phenotypical expressions come from. Um, everybody talks about phenotypes, this phenotypes, that, I mean, really, if you want to get down to the phenotypes and like what the plant, plant expresses, like what terpenes it produces, um, is all dependent on what your environment is and different environments. You can take the same, same cultivar and just put it in a different environment and the plant will produce more limonene or a plant will produce more citrine or the plant will produce more myrcene or beta carophyllene, you know, and, and you, the only thing you changed was the, the, the lighting, the CO2 and, and the humidity inside of it. And it will, it will completely give you a different, completely different flavor profile. Um, or even just a, a slightly different profile and just give you a very slight ex different expression. That's kind of the beauty of it, you know, is everybody's every, we're all growers and we're all kind of building these rooms and then the kind of like a part of your soul goes into it and then you can see what you did and how a living organism responds to it. In my eyes, that's like the coolest part of, of, of growing is, is being the curator of it. Um, so, I mean, I, I like to keep my temperatures pretty stable. I like it depending on, you know, your lights are going to, your photon output is going to tell you where to put your temperatures and where you're going to put your, your, your CO2. Um, and to directly answer your question, you know, the, you have people 1200, 1400 part per million of CO2, you know, ambient CO2 outside is about 400 PPM. You see people start at 700 in veg and go up to 12, 1400 and flower to keep up with the photosynthesis rates. Um, then you have the LEDs output, usually a more efficient photon usage. And so the plant's getting a, a better spread of photons across the board and for it to hitting, hitting the plant. And, and photon nutrition goes into elemental nutrition. So what you're going to, so your, your LEDs that are going to be pushing the plant to its maximum growth rate is going to require um, higher temperatures. It's going to require more CO2 and it's going to require more nutrients. Your plants are going to, you know, purple stem on you if you don't keep up with the nutrient load because um, all the energy is going to be used up taking care of the photons hitting the plant. So, um, you know, on humidity too dry, the plant's going to suffer too moist. You're going to grow mold. So you got, I like to stick between the 40 to 60% range as far as humidity goes. All these factor really goes down to the type of cultivar you're growing, the variety, because those are going to, some come from dry areas. Some come from very wet tropical areas. And it really depends on what you're growing as far as the type of environment and the type of, um, 
uh, lights, the humidity, whatever you're going to be throwing at the plant, the plant's going to biochemically take that and create that into its own profile. Understood. So going right down the line of fertilizer, want to get into that one next. You, you touched upon it. Now, there's more and more people going towards the organic side of things now. There's people who swear that if you're given the plant an organic fertilizer or organic regimen, it's going to create a better terpene profile. On the other side, you got people who are using synthetics that are saying, no, the organics break down to the same exact molecule that the, and then the plant's uptaking it. So there's no difference there. What's your thoughts on that? Can the fertilizer impact terpenes at all? Oh, yeah. And this is, this is a, a very deep rabbit hole. Um, so everybody hang on. Um, <laughs> so the, 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 the fun, so there's, we're going to, we're going to go from a very macro perspective of this, and then we're going to dive deep into each of the synthetics, what it's doing for the plant and the organics, what it's doing for the plant. Cause they're right. Molecules break down to molecules, right? And it's like the simplest form, but ratios are important. And the type of molecule is important. And nitrogen is not just nitrogen. So, um, just generally speaking, when it comes to plant nutrition, you're, your elements that you give the plant are going to be what the plant turns into enzymes that are going to create all these terpenes. So if you have a, your micronutrient profile, believe it or not, is going to be a very, a very important factor into what the plant creates because manganese and magnesium are both used in the process to make phenolic compounds, to make terpenes and flavonoids and, and and even active compounds inside the plant. So everything down to the elements that you are using is going to give you a different, if you, if you're, if you have a, is it going to give you a different terpene output, a different flavonoid output, a different, even, um, uh, uh, and antioxidant output in blueberries. Um, because all of these elements are what allows the plant to biochemically turn into something. So just 20 macro macro view, 20,000 feet, your nutrient profiles that you use are going to have a direct impact on the flavor and the, the terpenes that the plant is going to, to, to create. Um, so when you get down to it though, so making sure you have the right blend, micronutrient blend to macro blend to secondary element blend is really important. A lot of times you have these um, improper proportions of of micronutrients and the answer is more cow mag because micro because magnesium can supplement to the plant a function that manganese does so you know both of these elements you have to have things in the proper balance first and foremost secondarily nitrogen assaults are probably the um the plight to to getting flavor inside the plants. If you're using a high nitrate load, high urea, high ammonia, um, the plants, the, you're gonna have to increase the water load so much inside the plant that it's going to dilute out the sap. So what we see with like forage, for example, um, you know, like, like alfalfa, uh, the first chop is always the best when you grow alfalfa from seed. And that's because the plant has the sap doesn't have doesn't need all the extra nutrients that we put after you cut it the first time for like the second crop for it to grow back and we find that when you start applying nitrogen assaults like nitrates like urea ammonium nitrate the plant's water load goes up a ton and what ends up happening is that all the sap which contains all the flavor which contains all your, your total dissolved solids is going to get diluted out with water now. So yes, molecules break down to molecules, but when you start pumping nitrates into the plant, the plant's water load increases to the point where any flavor you did have is, is, is getting washed out now. Um, and this is why you see a lot of the hydronutrients produce crops that taste very similar because we rely on our, our um, carbo loads, we rely on our sweeteners to give the plant a form of carbon to kind of catch the bricks level up for the amount of, the amount of water load going up. Uh, Mississippi State did a really cool study on forage. And their first cut, they didn't put any application of nitrogen assaults down. The bricks level is about 12%, which is, de which is good for, for like grass. Um, after they did one application of ammonium nitrate, it dropped from 12% to 7%, the bricks level did. 
And that's because we're diluting out the sap content, the total dissolved solids of the plant with the increased nitrogen salts, bringing the water load up. So it's not that like you're using chemicals and the chemicals are, are causing the plant to produce a bad flavor. It's that we're just increasing the water load to the point where once we dry it, we just diluted out all of our, our, our flavor molecules to the plant. So when you look at organic growing, so that's like the synthetic rabbit hole, right? Is, is in order to get the, the potassium, the phosphorus, all these micro elements, the calcium into the plant, we need to increase, everything's attached to nitrate molecule, which brings a ton of water with it, which more, more nutrients, more water. So technically you're just diluting everything out. And the organic side of things, you don't have nitrogen assaults the way you do um, these, these synthetic fertilizers or these salt-based fertilizers. Your nitrogen assaults are wrapped up in guanos, is wrapped up in blood meal. There's carbon, there's, there's other molecules that are attached to it. So it's not just a free load of nitrates just getting pushed into your plant. Nitrates are important. Ammonia is important for the plant to produce into different compounds. You know, the plant, plant functions and lives off nitrates. I mean, hell, the, the lightning hitting the sky and taking the water molecules and uh, c conducting electrolysis takes the oxygen in the sky and the nitrogen in the sky, combines it into nitrates, and the nitrates rain down on us all the time. And that's why after a rain, you see the plants start growing like, really, really well. It's because they just got showered with light amounts of, of nitrates because nitrates are a part of our are part of nature and they're part of our society the problem though and this is why organic soil grown ultimately is is more flavorful is because we don't have the amount of nitrates getting pushed into the plant so the plant has more bricks more sap content and that's where all the flavor is that's where all your phenolic compounds are that are going to get turned into active compounds or terpenes or flavonoids or esters or styles they all are retained within the sap of the plant. And the biggest difference between soil grown and, and say salt grown is the nitrate load and polluting out the flavor that the plant naturally has. So you mentioned sap, you mentioned bricks. Let's get deeper into that. I do have a lot of beginners that tune into this podcast and they might not be aware of what, you, what you're talking about, sap, bricks. What is that and how do you measure it? And you know, how does that really relate to the flavor? I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit. I don't know if there's anything else to be said about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's not a common practice to, to look at the bricks level inside of a plant for for um, for, for the hydroponic industry. You know, we, we want to go for yields, and that's usually where we where we get to with it, and that's where it stops. Because um, your bricks level isn't going to tell you what your yields are going to be. In fact, there's usually a, a trade-off. High bricks usually means lower yielding plants. Um, but... The bricks itself is the essentially the total dissolved solids of the plant. Um, we're putting, you know, uh, calcium. We're putting different minerals, different ions into the plant, and the plant is going to have different amino acids and proteins and lipids and tannins and um, uh, phenolic compounds that get turned into terpenes and other active compounds, and all, all those are, are loaded within the sap of the plant. Um, the fluid of the plant, like like the blood in, in, in humans is like the, the sap inside plants. And so nat naturally, you know, if we have, if humans have thin blood or if we have blood that is low in iron or if we have something's wrong with our blood, something is very wrong with the human body. Same thing with plants where if our sap level is thinned out or your total dissolved solids is, is, is lower than where it should be, that's where plants are going to start getting attacked by pests. And that's where the plants are going to start getting uh, picked out and itemized by the different insects that are, that are migrating throughout the year or growing in, in that area. Um, and the BRICS level is a, the BRICS, the, a BRICS test is a test that we use to, to see ourselves where the nutrient, where the total dissolved solid level is within the plant. So, it's a, it's a positive correlation. So, you know, you have higher total dissolved solids, you have a higher bricks content, which means the plant has more molecules inside of itself to protect itself from, from pathogens, um, from different insects itself. Pests don't prefer the, the plants with a high bricks level because they have antimicrobials and, and, and compounds that are not attractive to the insects itself. Um, so we, 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 we measure the health of the plant based on the bricks level. Now we, 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 in agriculture, we will use this on grapes to see what the sugar content is because dissolved sugar 
inside the SAP is one of the, 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 the contents that we measure inside the BRICS test. So we measure fruits and vegetables with BRICS testing to see where the, the, where the sugar level's at. Wine, uh, making wine, they're huge into BRICS testing. Forage to n- measure how much nutrients is in the grass that we feed the cattle. Um, is we use a BRICS test for that. So it's, it's really telling us how many molecules are in the plant at one time. And higher water content means lower nutrient, which means lower uh, the, the nutrient density inside the plant is at a lower rate. And so that tells us we need to do, we need to adjust what we're feeding the plant to increase the BRICS level. So it's just, it's simply put, it's just a measurement that we can just tell the general overall health and dissolve solids within the plant. And so the sap is is the fluid that we can that we can taste. Um, think about a hot house tomato. You know, you have a tomato that's uh, the, the 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 fleshy, uh, or light red, very watery tomatoes. You, our bricks test test on that is going to be way low. That's mostly water. And that's why tomatoes taste like water now. It's because we grow them with salt with nitrogen and salts. You know, and when you have a nice organic grown tomato, it's it's deep red and it has, it has acidity acidity to it and it has flavor to it. And real tomatoes taste like a fruit, and not like a watery, fleshy, meaty, you know, vegetable. We want to make sure that the plants that we are growing hydroponically in our industry are having a higher bricks content compared to higher having a higher EC content inside. In, inside the medium or inside the reservoir. So it's a, it's a practice that we don't see a lot of inside the hydroponic industry that we should see a lot more of because that's ultimately what's going to tell us like where the flavor is at at the end of the plant's life. Understood. Yeah, I've heard about bricks and how it relates to pests. For example, I've heard that if it's 12% or greater, pests won't attack the plant as it would with a, a plant with lower bricks levels. But I didn't know bricks actually relates also relates to the terpene content in the plant. So that's super interesting. I know you need a a BRICS refractometer in order to actually do the measurements. You can get that online. I think uh, Amazon, you get a cheap one for like 20 bucks, or you can get a digital one for, I think it's like 150-ish bucks. Those digital ones are really cool, actually. Do you think all people should be having one of those and and testing the plants? I, I think it's a great tool to have. And as a grower, we should have every tool we can. You know, we should have pH probes that go into our soil that tell us the, the pH of our soil. We should have EC probes. You should have pH meters for water. You know, we should have every tool we can possibly have. Um, I prefer the digital ones for three refract- refractometers, especially when it comes to plant, like plant matter, and not um, not fruit or vegetables. When you're measuring plant matter, um, I, I like the digital ones because they're a little bit better at reading um, compared to your eyes, seeing it refracting, all the sugars and things refracting inside the scope. And then how often should they be doing a BRICS test? I mean, if they take a test today, for example, then do a change within their garden, when's an appropriate time to do the next test? So the the, the best way I look at it is we want to use this as a part of our eyes. Like you're taking soil slurries or measuring runoff, and that's your eyes for what's in the pot. You also want to have your eyes for what's in the plant. My, this isn't going to tell you how many terpenes you have. This isn't going to tell you how many calciums you have or how many sugars you have inside your plant. It's just going to give you a vision of overall plant health. And when you're going through, um, you know, stressful times, it's, it's it's just helpful to see where the plant's at and and and, and its general health. I like the digital ones um, specifically for plant matter because it's uh, it, it's still more accurate as far as like what's in the plant itself, and you don't have to use your eyes. But more so, um, it's really hard to squeeze plant matter and get the the juice out of it. Um, so I usually have like you only need like a drop or two of of the sap of the plant. So I usually take like a garlic press and just pack it in there and just squeeze. Um, and it's like one or two drops goes on the digital reader and it just tells you immediately what it is. Zero guesswork. Um, Hannah makes a great instrument for that. Um, also along with the, the type of instrument, um, you also want to make sure that you're using the proper part of the plant. Um, so plants are always changing. They're always, always evolving. They're always developing further. So I like to do it once a week, kind of just 
test on 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 my my bricks just to see where the plant's at. And I can usually see a deficiency before it happens by measuring the bricks, just because the plant will start to utilize its reserves and it'll start to um, it'll, 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 t- it'll tell you it'll kind of be like a quick a quick tip before the plant you know starts to show speckling or a plant starts to show yellowing the leaves. But you know, once a week works, once every other week also works. Um, just the plant changes so fast, so often that you just want to have just a frequent and like it, t- it takes two seconds. Um, you can take a leaf or take a petiole, which is probably the better place to, to take the, 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 con- the, the sample from, um, and then press it and get a drop or two out and let the reading tell you where you're at. Okay. That's pretty straightforward. I do want to work back to the fertilizer question because uh, I have a follow-up question on that one. I know there's going to be some people who, in the comments who are going to be um, distraught. Maybe that's that's a good word for it, <laughs> hearing that information. But really, my question is, how do consumers kind of avoid the bad fertilizers, right? Is there something that they can look on the back of the bottle and they could see like, okay, this includes this. I know this is going to be a harmful form of nitrogen that, that Tim had mentioned. You know, how, how do they establish what's good and what's bad as far as fertilizers sure um you can look at the back label and look at the nitrate load go to the guaranteed analysis and look at how much of the nitrogen is nitrate derived how much of it urea derived how much of it is ammonia derived um i prefer carbon-based nitrogen which is protein nitrogen um you do need a, a you do need a source of of nitrate usually it's in your soil with like what you amend it with um, so you don't need to add nitrates on top, but the best way that if you're looking at bottled fertilizer is look at your nitrate load, look if they're using any amino acids or if they're using any type of, uh, protein nitrogen in there. Um, that's first and foremost, second, secondarily, uh, look for ingredients that are, that are natural, that are carbon derived. Um, one of the biggest factors on the plant producing uh, terpenes and other other carbon-based molecules is the amount of carbon you're feeding it. And with organic soils, you can have, you know, humus and compost and worm castings in there that are, are constantly leaching carbon for the plant to take up and to turn into your, your terpenes and flavonoids and, and active molecules. Um, so, you know, make sure, biggest thing is making sure you're not just using salts, making sure there's some type of carbon form in there. Um, you know, if you see everything derived from nitrate, uh, phosphates, EDTA micronutrients, you're going to have a high, high water load to getting into your plant. And I wouldn't call it bad fertilizers per se. Um, I would, I would mostly just put them in a specific category. They're conventional fertilizers and they're going to do what conventional products do, um, which is create a high biomass but a low bricks content, which means you're going to yield really well. It's all going to taste like cardboard. It's all going to taste like water. Um, you're like growing tomatoes in soil compared to growing tomatoes hydroponically with some of these bad fertilizers. Your, your tomatoes grown hydroponically with these, with these salt blends are going to come out very bland in flavor. You know, that's why we see bad tomatoes everywhere now because they're all grown with, with salts. And that's why, you know, you grow, um, that tomato with, with, with organic soil, with amendments, with carbon-based nutrients, you're going to have the, the, the acidity increase. You're going to have all the antioxidants increase. You're going to have all the active molecules inside any of the fruits and vegetables are going to go off the chart by using, um, ingredients that are more carbon-based. So if you see rock phosphate, right? A lot of times these rock phosphates are, 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 are good because they slowly, slowly leach phosphorus into the soil, which allows the microorganisms to, to, to start feeding on the rock phosphate. And the microorganisms will start exuding all of these different carbon-based molecules. If we just use salts to grow plants, the plant doesn't have any carbon to use to convert into terpenes. So your terpene synthesis, your pathway goes from monoterpenes all the way over to sesquiterpenes, small to large, uh, terpene molecules. If the plant only has a certain amount of carbon, it's going to make it into small lightweight molecules and you're not going to have the spectrum that a plant with the carbon load is going to be able to create. So um, long story short is, is 
is tend to tailor away from nitrate based fertilizer systems. And so if you're looking at the back of the label, just go with the low nitrate profile, you know, and usually that means you're going to be top dressing. Usually that means you're going to be using um, protein based nitrogen, but it's important to start making that change now compared to continue producing the same crop with the same flavor as everybody else and, and not be satisfied. So, I mean, nitrates are good for producing biomass. Nitrates are not good for producing a BRICS content. Like I said, we saw, so at the end of that Mississippi State study that I, I mentioned before, did three applications of urea ammonium nitrate as one control, as ammonium nitrate as another control, and then just left the crop by itself. And it went from, with every application of a nitrogen assault, um, it went from 12% BRICS content, which is good, down to 7%, down to 6%, down to low 6% by the third application. So it cut your BRICS level in half, but your yield almost doubled um, compared to the control. So it really is trying, it's what you're, gonna, what you're going for, right? Not so I have a hard time with the bad fertilizer thing, because it's not bad, it's just conventional. And it's just going to give you, uh, it's just going to give you a specific result and we should just go into it knowing that we're going to get a lackluster crop in the end, but we're going to get a lot out of it. Understood. And man, you, you make me think because I did learn a little bit about terpenes in school. I went to Utah State University, just their online program for their cultivation certificates under Dr. Bruce Bugby. And there is a video on terpene synthesis. And so I learned about the five carbon building block terpene, and then you've got 10 carbon building block and, and 15 carbon building block, right? And you just mentioned those what I learned is that and what you just said is that these fertilizer programs are building just five carbon. They're mostly going to build a five carbon building block, right? Those are more volatile. Mm -hmm. So you're more likely to lose those than the 10 or the 15 carbon block terpenes. And I don't have any, all to memorize which ones are which, you know, what's limonene, what's mercy and, and so on and so forth. But it just got me thinking a little bit if, if the fertilizer, if the salt based fertilizer that you're using is causing the plant to create more five carbon building block terpenes, well, then you more chance of losing them, particularly during like drying, curing, storing and stuff like that. I'm still consuming medicine uh, from a year ago that I've had cured up. And that's just because the, the car, our carbon based nutrients give massive amounts of very, very small forms of carbon that the plant can use to turn into those 15 carbon building blocks. Um for, for the terpenes or for the flavonoids and mind you it will go from the small terpenes to the large terpenes and that's the same pathway all the way through then it goes to flavonoids and then it goes to more complex esters and it's this daisy chain effect and if the plant is deficient on carbon the plant is only going to use whatever carbon it can to create small molecules and not give you the the shelf life like some of these other molecules like these longer 15 uh, carbon chain molecules can and I think that really goes to show like um, what what nutrients can really do in, in the production of, of um, terpenes. Um, but there's another study out there uh, showing the relationship between uh, magnesium and manganese and how the plant produced more developed, more, more longer chained terpenes with just the addition of magnesium to the manganese. And, and it kind of goes to show that like Whatever the bio, the biochemical process making all of these terpenes and flavonoids inside the plant, really, it really, really does depend on the nutrient content that the plant has. What, what's the balance of micronutrients to secondary elements? Well, how much carbon content does the plant have to take up and to use as precursors? Um, so it really comes down to, I think, the, 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 the what you're giving the plant for it to be able to create in the end. Are you giving it nitrates that are going to be really good for biomass creation, but it's not going to give the plant very much as far as like terpene synthesis or flavonoid or any of these other active molecule antioxidant compounds and in, in blueberries. You know, um, I think, I think it really comes down to you get, you, you get out what you put in type of thing. That's wild. Yeah. I learned, learned so much on this one. And just connecting the dots on, on a lot of things. Let's move on. There's a few more things that certainly can impact terpenes that I want to get into. So microbiology. I've heard that you know the microbes in the soil can actually impact the terpene profile. Number one, is that true? Number two, is there a specific consortium of microbes that impact the flavor of certain terpenes being produced? I would say all microbes. I mean, 
the the really cool part about microbes is they really exude purely carbon-based molecules. All their enzymes, carbon-based. All their organic acids, carbon-based. Acetic acid, acetobacter bacteria, acetic acid is extremely important for the for the, as a simple acid for the plant to turn into all of its biological molecules. Carboxylic acids are are what the plant will release from the root system to go find elements. And once these carboxylic acids at root exudates match up with these elements, it sends a flag saying, hey, I'm one of yours, and the plant can take it up at that point. Bacteria and fungi even break down molecules, consume them, wrap them into carbon, and excrete them out into a carbon-based molecule. So that's really why all of these um, all these microorganisms throughout the world um, indigenously inside the soil and the ones we're using will have an impact on, on the flavor produced inside the crop. Um, there's, I can't remember who did it, but there was a study. I'll have to find it. I'll send it to you. It's a really cool study on, uh, grapes and they're making wines out of, I think it was in Chile and they're making wines out of two different soil compo- the, the two different three, two, three different regions of soil. What they ended up doing is taking these regions of soil, growing um, a crop in it with the, mic- the microbes that are thriving, and they took the same soil and they, they, they nuked it. They completely killed any consortia and they made, made a sterile soil out of it. The, the bricks level in, in the grapes, when they measured the sugar content, it was like half the sugar content the normal the normal grapes were in fact they had way less tannins they had way less all all the the whole spectrum of molecules completely changed within the grape plant all because they sterilized the soil Uh, so i would even go into saying that like you know the 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 soil profile itself is really important um so like grapes grown in france is different than grapes grown in chile and chile grapes are different than the ones in um italy and you see that not only does the the complex the, the the elements inside the soil matter, but what really really comes down to is the spectrum of microorganisms inside the soil because that's what produces all the carbon based molecules around the root system that the plant's going to take up and to turn into all these flavors and 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 all these dissolved solids within the plant itself. So the microbes play, I would say, just as big as a role as the elements you put into the plant as far as. Um, how the plant, how the flavor profile is going to come out and the terpene production is going to come out and the sugar content is going to be produced inside the crop. What are your thoughts on like the bottled microbial inoculants that are being sold that are kind of, you know, a, lot, a lot of them are limited in the diversity versus if you go out in your backyard, do the IMO process, you can get so much more diversity. Yeah, I think it, uh, the more diverse complex of microorganisms you have, the more complex the aromas and the flavors are going to come out. Um, I also think that goes into active compound synthesis. So uh, making all the favorite compounds we have in our medicinal plants and all the antioxidants and the blueberries and things that keep us healthy um, really come down to the consortia of bacteria and fungi and archaea and, and nematodes and, and everything, protozoa and all the, the organisms that are part of their, their food chain that they all eat each other and, and cycle through inside the soil. I think all of those really go down to getting the plant access remember it's about what you get out what you put in so all those those little machines those little microbes are giving the plant a, a, a wide variety of consortium of organic molecules carbon-based molecules that the plant can take up and synthesize into whatever they want that's why an inoculated crop whether it's a bottle or whether you use indigenous soils are always going to produce a better flavor crop than using a sterilizing agent like cleanse all the time um, and just constantly nuking everything, and you just the plant has no available organic compound to synthesize as a precursor into these flavors, into the the sugars, into um, the the terpenes. I mean, I like a lot of the the bottles of inoculants out there. I think you're always going to get a better profile inside an indigenous soil and just curating that indigenous soil with other carbon based ingredients, prebiotics different plant proteins animal proteins things that can wake wake up the soil essentially um you're always going to have a way better consortia of organic compounds around your plants with all those microbes breeding and growing like crazy compared to a sterilized athena based crop you know where they 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 push sterility in your grow rooms 
Um, they want you just to use their, their salt blends and keep everything sterile. And I think that is completely ignorant to what nature does and how nature has evolved over the years, because it's supposed to, your plants are supposed to have endophytes and, and, and ectophytic bacteria around the root systems. It's supposed to have a mycorrhizae relationship. They're supposed to be rock phosphate in the soils that the mycorrhizae can latch onto and consume and directly inject the phosphorus into the root system of the plant. I think there's, there, you, you know, a, a bottled consortia of these microorganisms is way better than no consortia at all. Got it. And kind of relating to what you had said, you know, the, the mycorrhizal network down in the medium companion plants. I want to get into that because that is said to actually have an impact on terpene synthesis, right? So, for example, strawberries. If you're growing strawberries next to a medicinal plant, some say that you could potentially get a terpene profile similar to strawberries in that medicinal plant. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I, I think there's something to say. Um for um, root exudates and and different plants talking to each other and sharing uh, nutrition and 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 organic molecules, I think other plants will also attract a different consortia of uh, microbiology around the different rhizospheres of the plant. You know, certain certain crops will have a certain natural, um, like beans having a natural legume. Um, uh, loving bacteria, zotobacter bacteria. You know, they, they legumes promote um, nitrogen fixation microbes, cover crops. You know, I think, I, I think it's, I think plants naturally will want to interact with each other inside an ecosystem. So when you start putting different plants together, I think naturally they're going to, they're going to share and they're going to be different than them by themselves. Absolutely. Got it. There's a few more things I want to get into. I mean, we could talk about this topic for hours if we really wanted to, but uh, <laughs> dude, I know I'm, we really can. <laughs> ideal storage conditions in order to conserve terpenes, right? So if you're not storing it in the proper conditions, like I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, these terpenes can volatize, right? You can lose them. You know, when you go in your grow room and you're smelling, those are terpenes volatizing. So like storage side of things, I think is often overlooked. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks on drying, proper drying conditions curing, having the right moisture content, but storage, a lot of people I feel like neglect, unfortunately, and they're losing a lot of that terpene profile, just volatizing away. So what's the ideal storage condition in order to conserve terpenes? So I struggle, and me and the rest of the state, I mean, probably four state area on this side of the um, this side of the United States, the Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah area. Um, even Nevada, we struggle with having any humidity here. Um, it's we're lucky to get thirty percent humidity most days, and really good storage conditions is about sixty percent um, inside your jars. And of course, the the biggest thing is is um, the UV radiation. UV is very, very, very good at breaking apart molecules. Um, so usually, clear jars stuck out in the sunlight are going to volatilize terpenes way faster than anything else, way faster than heat, way faster than ambient, um, arid environments. I think, uh, a lot of it, what you need to do is keep it in a cool, dark place. Um, and keep it as, um, once you, once you cure it or once you dry it to a certain, to a certain to extent, making sure that it stays in a sealed container. No plastic. Plastic leaches so bad. And because plastic is petro-based molecules, it's carbon-based molecules, all these terpenes are going to evaporate and purge through the, the plastic. So plastic is your enemy. Use glass. I like amber glass personally. And I like to keep my stuff in, in a drawer or like in a, in a uh, tote and just keep them in a cool dry spot. Pretty straightforward. All right, so let's wrap things up. Tell us, how can the listeners find you, and what do you have upcoming in the future? Oh, man, uh, lots of good stuff. You can find us um, through our Discord. Uh, if you guys have a profile, you can come out to our Discord and, and come chat with us there. We have a lot of really good uh, uh, literature that, I, that's based on, that our products are based on. 
Um, I post all our literature there. We have a really good community. We do giveaways there. We have a discount code for our Discord users. Um, generally, just a place where we can all talk to each other. We're very active on Instagram. So you can go to um, at cul.tur.ed on Instagram, and you can come find us and talk to us and see all the cool things we're up to. Um, we've been doing a lot of product videos, how-tos, um, showing people how these powders dissolve into water. Um, our YouTube also, uh, youtube.com backslash culture biologics. Uh, we're putting a bunch of good product videos and a bunch of, uh, just general, uh, frequently asked questions on there. So everybody has a, a, a source for all of our, um, videos and, um, all of our, all our science and just documented stuff that we're trying to get out there for everybody to kind of learn and, and understand. Awesome. Well, if you're tuning in on YouTube, I'll definitely have a link to his YouTube channel down in the description section below of this video. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button. Also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode. I'd love for you to tune into future episodes. Tim, we might have to do a part three. You know, we have to... <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. There, there's more we could have got into for sure. I actually know that there were some questions left on the previous episode. Maybe in the next episode, we can go over some of those. And then I guess if you guys have any questions tuning into this, leave those questions in the comment section on the YouTube video. And uh, I'll go through that. And hey, maybe next time around, it's just kind of like a Q&A type thing where we're just firing off a bunch of scientific-based questions at you because your, your knowledge when it comes to the science is very deep. And I'm glad that you sat here today and we were able to get some of that out of you. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on. I, I re really enjoy our conversations and all the feedback I get from everybody. And I like, you know, just helping out. I got all this stuff in my head and I'd like to be able to get it out and share with everybody because it's... I, I, find it helpful. Yeah, it's fun. And I learned a lot and I'm sure my audience learned a lot as well. So once again, thank you. And uh, yeah, peace out everyone. We'll catch you in the next episode.